Hi, this is Dr. Mike Chupp, and I am so glad that you're listening right now to CMDA Matters, a weekly podcast from the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. You know, for many years, our banner has been our motto, changing hearts in healthcare. Well, my guest this week is Mr. George Carneal. He's author of the book, From Queer to Christ, My Journey into the Light. I had, was battling drugs and alcohol and I had a sex addiction. I was a prostitute. I was struggling with depression and I eventually attempted suicide. It was as if God was kind of working on me then and showing me, this is going to be your destiny if you continue to stay in this life. Well, just a little background on George Carneal. He grew up in the 1970s, raised by a Southern Baptist minister in the Bible Belt. But for years, he struggled because of a conflict between his Christian upbringing and a same-sex attraction. George shares with us openly today about his painful journey through a secular world that tacitly was advancing a gay lifestyle while facing his own religious community that was hostile toward homosexuals. Mainstream culture today continues to glamorize the lifestyle of the LGBTQ community. But as we'll hear from George, the gay life in his experience was anything but that. I welcome you to listen in on my conversation with Mr. George Carneal, a man whom God dearly loves and radically transformed from being queer to being a co-heir with Christ. Well, I'm delighted to welcome to CMDA Matters today, Mr. George Carneal. Thank you for having me on the show. Well, George, you uh, released a book, you published a book back in 2016 entitled From Queer to Christ, My Journey into the Light. What a powerful story of transformation. And I wrote a note to myself um, that you're the prodigal son minus the inheritance, I think. Yes. <laughs> no one here. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you just talk a little bit about yourself? Uh, you Obviously, a lot of details in the book. And with a title like that, I'm sh- maybe some of our listeners are like, wow, I want to hear this. Just share with us a little bit about your journey into the light. Well, I am the son of a Southern Baptist minister, and I really wanted to detail the book especially for Christians to understand what it's like for someone who is struggling with the same sex attraction and their faith. And for me, I really wanted to detail the struggle I went through in school, the disconnect from my male peers, the bullying, the threats, being physically assaulted. In addition to the pain and the heartache of being in a church setting where I would hear numerous pastors rail against Sodom and Gomorrah about homosexuals and how God hated fags. God created AIDS to kill the fags. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of homosexuals. And for me, the pain and heartache of dealing with this issue, and especially in the 70s when celebrities weren't coming out, there certainly wasn't the internet. No one was really talking about this issue unless it was spoken with such venom in church. And I was really struggling and hurting, trying to understand how did I become saddled with these feelings? and the anger that I felt as to why my brothers and my sister weren't homosexual as well. So I detail how the foundation had been laid to where when I finally went into a gay bar, why I became so easily addicted to that life and why it was so hard to get out of that life. And what I really want to expose for Christians and for them to understand is that Hollywood gives and the media, they give a very sanitized, glamorized version of what the gay life is like. But until you hear the stories of those who've lived in the trenches of that life, and I was in it for 25 years, we're here to tell you the real horror stories of what it's like to live in that world. And while my book is not X-rated, I certainly don't sugarcoat anything. Right, it's very vivid. I I was just, uh, wow, I I was just suffering with you through that journey. And that's a very (laughs) G-rated, sanitized version of my life. But I wanted to give enough of a glimpse into that world to where I know many of you Christians have LGBT friends, family, and co-workers that you love and care about, and you feel like affirming that life is the right thing to do. And yes, you should affirm them as human beings in terms of loving on them and pouring love into them and being Christ-like toward them. But you are also need to tell them the truth of God's Word because 
when you affirm that and you push them into the life, you really don't know what you are pushing them into. And not only are you pushing them into a life of enslavement, but you are pushing them into bondage and into further rebellion against God. And God, if he was okay with it, he wouldn't be pulling so many LGBT individuals out of that life. And I hear from so many LGBT individuals from all around the world who are so miserable. They're trapped and they can't see a way out of that life. And I'm asking Christians today to please arm yourself with information Mm -hmm. and help these individuals. Let them know that they can come out of that bondage. And when you invite them into the church, give them a safe place to sit under a pastor who hopefully has the guts and the conviction to preach the truth of God's word so the Holy Spirit can work in their life. Because we have no power to change anyone, but the power of the Holy Spirit, if he gets a hold of them, some change will happen. In the meantime, allow them to have a safe place to hear God's word and don't mistreat them, but definitely tell them the truth of God's word. And to pastors, I would definitely encourage you when you speak on the issue of homosexuality, say it in love. Yes, condemn the sin, but also condemn the sin of heterosexuals so the homosexuals won't feel like they are being unjustly picked on. Also talk about adultery and fornication, pornography and sleeping outside of marriage, living together and being unmarried. So at least the LGBT individuals will know that the pastor is truly speaking about sin, the sin of homosexuals and heterosexuals, Mm -hmm. but that there is a God who loves them and redemption is available and there is hope. Just for our listeners' benefit, what brought you into the light? I mean, what actually happened? If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. When did that new creation happen? When I first went into that life within three years, this is how bad that life is in terms of the pitfalls of what you are surrounded with. I had was battling drugs and alcohol, and I had a sex addiction. I was a prostitute. I was struggling with depression, and I eventually attempted suicide. But understand, the gay life is a very promiscuous life, and it is also a youth-oriented culture. So for me, when the light bulb went on was when I was sitting in a CD bar (laughs) in Hollywood, and I was noticing the regulars in terms of old men who would sit at the bar and get drunk week after week. I realized this is going to be my destiny. Because once your looks fade, your body falls apart and you get old, you're not the new fresh meat on the market. And it was as if God was kind of working on me then and showing me, this is going to be your destiny if you continue to stay in this life. Before I really fully committed my life to Christ, I started to get honest about that life. How much pornography and sex and drugs and alcohol and partying can you do? There was nothing that was filling that void. I was still empty. And it was as if God, he was so gracious in terms of what I needed to do to wake up, to surrender my life to him and to walk out of that life. But the battle for me was not so much in terms of me wanting to rebel against God or run from him. I hated Christians. I had been so hurt by them. And going into the church for me was the lion's den. Mm. And so I did not want to go into church. So I was trying to get to God through Hinduism and the occult and through New Age. I was really searching for something, but nothing would stick. And God was exposing the holes even in those world religions. But thankfully, God did put some wonderful Christians in my life who had the heart of Christ, and they slowly helped immerse me back into the church. And from there, the healing process started. Now, you're speaking and sharing from God's Word. What does your ministry look like right now? Obviously, you're an author. What sort of ministry are you doing in terms of trying to help the LGBT community come to understand the gospel, the real gospel, the love of Christ and redemption, restoration? Describe that for me today. I do hear from a lot of LGBT individuals who, again, are just struggling. And they see the media will not highlight stories like mine and so many others. They have a certain narrative. And so even when I was in the life, I didn't know that there were successful people who had left that life. I thought you had to become a heterosexual. And for many of us, God hasn't changed our feelings. Now, I've come to see that in hindsight, God really had to do a work on me because I've had to struggle with rejection, trauma, shame. There are a lot of root core issues that through counseling, God has been able to work with me and help me to get healing through those issues. As with so many other LGBT individuals, most of us have been through some form of trauma, rape, shame, incest, abuse, you name it. 
So there needs to be patience and compassion. So I tried to get them to see what it has looked like for me leaving that life and what the transition has been like. But little did I know that it seems like a lot of my ministry is with parents. Because when they reach out to me and they tell me their kids are cutting themselves, they're attempting suicide, they've committed suicide, they're in and out of mental institutions, they're depressed, they've abandoned their faith, they have drug and alcohol issues, they've been raped, they're transitioning to the opposite gender. They are so distraught, they don't know how to help their kids. And when I ask them, well, do you have a good network of people in the Christian church who can pray with you and walk with you on this journey and pray for your child? And Mike, they sadly tell me, no, I don't trust Christians because most of them know that they will be judged or their kids will be talked about. Some of them don't even trust their own pastors. So I have to question what is the message that the pastor is giving from the pulpit If he's not giving a message to everyone in that church, it doesn't matter what your bondage is. You can trust me. You can talk to me. And we're going to be here to love on you, pour love into you, and walk with you on this journey. So I have really tried to work with a lot of parents, even through Skype and just email and what have you, talking to them on the phone, just encouraging them and giving them some definite do's and don'ts in terms of how to handle this situation. Because A lot of parents, if they handle this incorrectly, understand, and I did this with my own family, I cut my father off for four years. I rarely contacted my family, and I certainly cut him off for four years. And LGBT individuals will do that because we're hurting. And understand, when you have a father who's a pastor telling you that this is not compatible with God's word, I'm not looking at it from a spiritual perspective. I was looking at it from an earthly perspective to be told that I can't love someone and be loved, that who I love is wrong in God's eyes, and that to leave this behind and to follow Christ, it left me in such despair and in depression and sadness and sorrow and hopelessness because we all want to love and be loved. And that was the dilemma for me. But at the time, I couldn't see that my dad was really looking at this from an eternal perspective. And I'm so thankful that God was gracious and allowed me to get to the point of where I could see it from that perspective and to be able to turn my back on that life. How do we effectively demonstrate and tell these patients as Christians in healthcare that we love them and we don't accept the lifestyle, especially as healthcare professionals, and we see damage, just as there was damage in your life over 25 years? How would you suggest coming from your experience? For me to answer your question, what I wished had happened to me when I was a kid, I wish there had been Christians who were sensitive enough to notice something different about me, as withdrawn and as depressed as I was. And I wish someone had sat down and said to me privately, are you struggling with a same-sex attraction or maybe gender dysphoria, whoever it is? But if so, they said, look, I've got some good news for you. You may be struggling with this. Let me show you in God's word what it says about homosexuality. And while pointing it out, it would I'm sure it would hurt me. I would be confused. But if they would then turn around and say, but let me show you some good news and some hope. Let me tell you how much God loves you. And this would probably have made such an impact on me had I known that God really loved the homosexual. Because again, the message was always that God hates homosexuals. And so I want to say to those who are listening, When you're dealing with these individuals, most of them have been abused. They've been kicked out of their homes. Their families have mistreated them. They've disowned them. They've probably most likely been mistreated by Christians. And here's a chance for you to undo that damage and plant a seed just in love. Even if they are really resistant at first, most of them cannot deal with the fact that someone would love them and care about them. And if you ever just stopped and asked them, please tell me about your journey. How did you get here today? And I'm not going to judge you. I just want to listen. You're going to hear some heartbreaking stories. And if you would just pray for these individuals and just hug on them and love on them and give them hope by, yes, sharing the truth of God's word, but also highlighting the hope that is available because of what Jesus did on the cross. And I would like for your listeners to know that in the back of my book, I do list all of the talking points of the LGBT activists and even the liberal theologians who push the gay is okay narrative that we're under grace. It's okay to be a homosexual. And I debunked that with scripture. And the reason why I took the time to put that in there, and I would encourage you to get it and read it and familiarize yourself with those talking points, because some of them will come at you with those talking points, because they're not going to sit down and read God's word for themselves to get the truth. 
So here's a chance for you to lovingly debunk that and then do it with scripture and pour love into them. And I did it because I knew I wouldn't have time to sit with all of my LGBT friends and witness to them. But I knew once I gave them the book and talked about hell and Sodom and Gomorrah and their need for a savior and put in the gospel and the plan of salvation and then debunked the talking points, I knew they had all of the information and their blood was no longer going to be on my hands. Well, Art, I feel as the CEO of CMDA that one of the main themes in my mind, George, is that our mandate is to model the Lord Jesus, to model the Master. And when I was thinking this morning, actually just this morning, I was thinking about LGBT and how those letters now, maybe three or four years ago, they didn't flow off my tongue so quickly, and now they just do, they flow. And I was just thinking about Jesus' day and, you know, who represented that group in his life and what, how did he treat them? And I was thinking, in his day, LGBT meant left. Lepers, Gentiles, blind, tax collectors, and sinners. I <laughs> mean, that, th- those were the fringe elements of his day, and yet those are the folks. Those are the folks he hung out with, and of course, the poor as well. And so, our mandate is to model how he accepted them, and of course, he drew the ire of the Pharisees and the other religious people of his day that he would hang out with folks like that. What advice right now do you have for those who? are in the church, they love the Lord Jesus, they believe on him, and they're currently struggling to reconcile their homosexual attraction with their Christian faith. First of all, they can read my book or listen to the media interviews I've done on my YouTube channel. There's even information on my website. Maybe some of that will help them, but I would just encourage them by saying this. You walking out of that life doesn't mean that you're going to have a miserable life. What you lose in the process God is going to fill that void in many other ways. And what God has done for me, I've been celibate for over 13 years now. And out of that life, my anxiety level, my depression, the suicidal thoughts are gone. I finally have peace. I want them to know, I know this is a hard battle. And I don't say any of this lightly. I have shed the tears over this issue and the pain of what I've been through trying to get out of that bondage. But I want you to know if you will stick with God on this journey, he will reward you for it. I'm letting you know now you will never find peace and contentment and joy in that life and in doing something that God deems wicked. And that goes for the heterosexuals who are living together and they're not married or having sex outside of marriage. They don't get a pass as well. So understand God is not picking on you. He's not picking on us. He loves us. But when you do what God's word says and don't do the things that he says not to do, You're going to find a peace and a joy and a contentment in your life and a rewarding relationship with God that is indescribable. But also in those moments when you feel lonely and you just think, I just miss being with someone, understand we can look at the times that we are in and how we know that Jesus is returning soon. So even in those moments where I feel sometimes a little lonely and sad, I have the joy and comfort of knowing when Jesus returns, I will never, ever have to deal with these feelings again. And I stay focused on the eternal reward. And so I want to encourage all of you, if you are listening and you are struggling with that issue, you can go to my website and you can look for my email address and send me an email. I'm happy to help where I can. My website is www.georgecarneal.com. That's C-A-R-N-E-A-L. Well, I want to commend you, George, for speaking out and uh, trust that God will use your book uh, entitled From Queer to Christ, My Journey into the Light. Um, Did you self-publish that or who published that for you? I did self-publish it because some publishers didn't want to touch it. I bet, I bet. George, thank you for your kindness for joining us today. Thank you for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Well, I'm so grateful today that George was willing to share his powerful story with us. And maybe you've been challenged like me to love your patients, your staff members, or your colleagues who identify as LGBTQ, to love them just as Jesus Christ would, both sacrificially and unconditionally. If you'd like to read his book entitled From Queer to Christ, you can find it on Amazon, And there will also be a direct link available with the web info associated with our podcast today. We also carry some very helpful books about sexuality on our CMDA website. 
You might remember Dr. Christopher Ewan, a professor at Moody Bible Institute and our recent National Convention plenary speaker. He was my guest on CMDA Matters earlier this year, and his book entitled Holy Sexuality is one that I highly recommend. I've given it a copy of that book to my own young adult kids, and they have found it very helpful as they interact with antagonistic friends at work and in various social circles. Another great book I recommend is Love Thy Body, Answering Hard Questions About Life and Sexuality by Dr. Nancy Piercy, who's also been a past National Convention plenary speaker. It's a superb resource for looking at same-sex attraction through a distinctly biblical lens. Well, I'm guessing that you've been hearing a lot of news lately about conversion therapy bans. In many states and actually in other countries, conversion therapy, as it's called, is now fully banned in 20 states as legislators have been told horror stories of conversion treatments like electrical shock therapy and even sexual abuse to stop same-sex attraction in its tracks. In today's professional mental health counseling environment, such archaic practices are uniformly viewed in the profession as unethical and any licensed professional found using them would be censured by their state accrediting bodies. As Christian healthcare professionals, we certainly condemn this sort of inhumane and cruel therapy, but I have to ask the question, does it even really exist anymore in the professional realm? We are increasingly concerned at CMDA that these therapy bans now put Christian mental health professionals who offer change allowing therapy. And I think that's a very important term to remember, change allowing therapy, to put those kind of individuals who offer that at risk with these bans. Highly trained and caring counselors who are responding to their own clients who come requesting help and support with unwanted same-sex attraction. Those professionals are being put at risk with these therapy bans. Well, the American Medical Association in a 2019 brief defined conversion therapy as, quote, any form of intervention that attempts to change an individual's sexual orientation or sexual behaviors, end quote. Ongoing use of that term, conversion therapy, when broadly applied and defined in the way that the AMA has done, it can tie the hands of our Christian mental health professionals and limits the options of any client who experiences unwanted same-sex attraction or even gender dysphoria. While these laws supposedly do not apply to religious leaders, many Christian therapists practice counseling outside a protective church environment. The American Psychiatric Association, or APA, completely eliminated homosexuality from the list of mental disorders in the late 1980s. However, gender incongruity remains a symptom of a myriad of different recognized mental illnesses, including gender dysphoria, personality disorders, PTSD, or autism spectrum disorders. According to the APA, Most children naturally come to identify with his or her biological sex by early adulthood. These bans that I've been describing could prevent counselors from treating legitimate mental illnesses in keeping with their training, knowledge, and experience. Well, we sometimes hear from members about the discrimination they have experienced in the workplace because of their faith and life-affirming convictions. Healthcare right of conscience protects healthcare professionals of faith, not only in the setting of abortion refusal, but in more recent years, LGBTQ groups have been targeting psychotherapists and counselors with strict regulations in this area of conversion therapy. So much so that many counselors are actually afraid to even discuss the topic of sexuality with their patients. Conscience violations can occur in any specialty within healthcare, which is why you who are listening need to understand your statutory conscience rights and protection under U.S. law. 
At CMDA, we can often help you, our members, by referring you to an allied group of attorneys who provide excellent legal services, sometimes even pro bono, depending upon your case and the situation. I want to encourage you to understand your legal rights before it gets to a crisis that might even threaten your career. I've mentioned it many times before, but help is available at our freedomtocare.org website, where you can find excellent resources to support you in providing health care according to conscience, conscience that is informed not only by available medical evidence that you know well, but also by God's holy word. That website is freedom, the numeral two, and the word care, freedomtocare.org. I'm very excited to give you a heads up that CMDA will be partnering with Dallas Theological Seminary on October 1st to bring you a webinar entitled The Church and Science in a COVID World. That'll be from 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time on October 1st. This webinar is free, but you will need to register to attend that day. Just go to cmda.org slash DTS webinar to sign up for October 1st. If you've enjoyed listening over the past many months in 2020 to CMDA Matters, would you let us know? Just take out your cell phone and record yourself telling us who you are and why you love listening to CMDA Matters. Send your recording to communications at cmda.org and you might be featured on one of our coming podcasts. Well, as I close this podcast, George Carneal shared his testimony with us today, and he does that all the time with as many people as he can in order to expose the darkness and sadness of the homosexual lifestyle. We must be on our guard for these mainstream cultural norms of sexuality that lead us and our kids and our patients away from a fulfilling relationship with Father God. The LGBT community trumpets sexual freedom. But George, he explained to us today that acting on this desire, which God calls sin, it only leads to bondage and enslavement. George's warnings about the false, glamorous portrayal of the LGBT lifestyle remind me of the warnings about false teaching in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19 in the ESV, where Peter says, they, false teachers, promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. Oh, listening friends, more than ever, we've got to guard our hearts from false teaching and lean on the eternal word of God, trusting that he truly wants us to flourish and find true freedom as his children. Guarding your heart, it must be a top priority as you practice in healthcare. And because that is a priority and matters to you, it matters to CMDA and CMDA matters. Let's do this again next week, okay? I'll see you then. This podcast has been a production of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. The opinions expressed by guests on this podcast are not necessarily endorsed by the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. CMDA is a nonpartisan organization that does not endorse political parties or candidates for public office. The views expressed on this podcast reflect judgments regarding principles and values held by CMDA and its members and are not intended to imply endorsement of any political party or candidate.